And so I think that means that we are live. It says that we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is what is this? Uh, how to get started uh, with developmental editing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the traditional thing and read the panel description first. So. Writing rarely a 1 and done process. Most of us are instead looking forward to multiple rewrites and file names like final final seriously final. This is it for real final. Doc doc. How do writers and editors navigate this process? How do you translate feedback to the page? What do you do with criticism that misses its mark? And how do you know when you're really done? This panel of writers and editors will discuss tools and strategies for breaking a narrative down and building it back up, all while maintaining the integrity of the story you wanted to write in the first place. So, I'm Nina Zippery. I'm the mod for tonight. Uh, we're going to go through introductions first. Um, Kate, would you mind starting us off? Sure, I'm Kate Mariyama, and I'm a writer, um, and also I teach novel classes, and I do developmental editing for hire, so I have a lot of thoughts on the matter, and um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Mike, would you go next? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm a writer and an editor and a publisher. Uh, I run a, a little micro press called Mythic Delirium Books, and you know, for the purposes of today's topic, that's probably where the things that I do most intersect with developmental editing because of books that I have uh, seen to fruition, in, including uh, Bone Swans, the debut collection from CSE Cooney that won the World Fantasy Award, and uh, the most recent collection from Theodora Goss. Uh, Snow White Learns Witchcraft that just won the Mythopoeic Award about a month ago. <laughs> so, yay. Uh, and uh, the w the only uh, the only big novel that we've put out so far, Latchkey by Nicole Corner Stace, which was uh, a best of the year selection by Carcass Reviews. So, uh, so, so doing that sort of thing involves a lot of developmental editing. And, Thus, I'm on this panel. Thank you. Jordan, would you mind going next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jordan Ifueco. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm author of the best selling Ray Bearer novel. Its sequel, Redemptor, is coming out this August. Um, developmental editing is probably the reason why it took me 12 years to write my first book from the time I was 13 to the time I was 25 just because um, that's, that's, it almost feels like a bit of a vending machine. Like if I spend just like hours and hours on this one plot thread, then I don't actually have to finish the book. Like I can just go back and keep editing and editing. Or if it's done, I never have to turn it in if I always just shine it up a little bit more. <laughs> so um, I'm here, I guess, because I'm a developmental editing addict. <laughs> Hi, Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, LaShawn. Hi, everyone. My name is LaShawn M. Wanick. Uh, I am also a writer. Uh, I write short stories and I did finish writing a novel that is currently out uh, being shopped around. So, and <laughs> I, I got a leg up on you, Jordan, because it took me longer to finish that book. Wow. <laughs> so, um, but I am also uh, the editor of the uh, the fiction magazine Giga Notasaurus, um, which accepts uh, short stories and novellas. Um, so I've also done editing with that as well. Uh uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Nina Cipri. Uh, I am a professor as well. Um, and I have a defect, which is a sequel to the novella Fina, which is now nominated for the Hugo and the Nebula and the Lambda <laughs> Award. Um, it's been a weird spring, y'all. Um, defect is going to be out this Tuesday. Um, and I've Come, I come at de developmental editing from like two sides. One, as a writer, obviously, I tend to go through like multiple drafts. I've thrown out entire drafts before. And 
Also, as a teacher, I teach creative writing. So I've been working with students, like, uh, especially this spring, I've been working with two different students, helping them write um, not their first novels necessarily, but like the first drafts and now the second drafts of these of their theses. Um, so, yeah, just to clear the air, developmental editing, very different than other kinds of editing. This isn't a, a process by which people like really get like break a narrative down to its bare bones occasionally and then build it back up. So we're all also writers here. Um, so I'd like to actually start talking about the writing process. Um, so when you're drafting, how much thought do you put into planning? Like, you know, where do you lie on that uh, plotter versus plant, pantser versus planter, whatever divide? How do you decide something's good enough to send out? Um, how are you setting yourself up for success as you're writing? And whoever feels moved can talk first. Um, I'll go. I, I every different book is its own adventure. Sometimes the plot is first. Other times it's driving around in the dark and finding your way along. And and you know. Um, and so I'll take a good long time just sort of finding my way until I have a nice big lump of clay. They always say that um, artists buy the clay and the paints, writers have that first draft. And that's when I really dig in and start to do a developmental edit. And only when I'm through that do I feel like it's ready for beta readers. I have some friends I send to for notes before I go into the next draft. I for me, too, it, it often depends on the story. Uh, I have some stories where I really plotted them out and, and worked out backgrounds of characters in great detail, and others where I just started with a sentence and kept going and just decided to see what would happen. Uh, lately, I think because I've had trouble producing the level of concentration required to create a, re a really good outline, uh, I've been much more of a pantser, and that has been working okay for short stories. Uh, I, I guess a way to look at pantsing is the rough draft is the outline. Uh, but I also have a, a, a new novel draft that I did that way, and it's kind of a disaster. <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I feel like I will, I, I feel like I've learned a lesson uh, being more cautious about taking on something that size and that way, but who knows? So, Mike, I'm the exact opposite of you right now, uh, because I used to be a huge pantser. And for me, I always had an idea and I would always write out that first draft. And then after I read, write that draft, I would dive into it and say, what's not working? What needs to be changed? Um, and that actually involves a lot of free writing. It's like, how do I feel about the story? What do I, you know, what would make it better? And, you know, I will go through a bunch of rewrites. Um, as of- Those late, are in my future. <laughs> <laughs> um, as of late, I've been learning to write from an outline. Um, and that has been an interesting process because it's like, it, it's creating the world before you actually sit down and write the story. And that's something that I've been doing within the past couple of years. And for me, it's like, okay, I want to write the story and I actually try to, but then it's like, oh, but how do I know about this? And so I actually have to go back and say, well, what about this part of the story and this part of the story and this part? And it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> That, that know, sounds like the that sounds like the exact polar reverse of what I've been experiencing. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I haven't decided yet because the only two that's not true. I did write like a really terrible novel set in Italy when I was fifteen, but besides that, <laughs> these are my two finished books, and I approach them really different ways by necessity. Mm -hmm. I started Ray Bear as a kid, so I could pants that just because I had time. Like I'd write a bunch of stuff and then I'd new learn a new thing about how novels work and I'd start from the beginning. And I did that over and over and over again <laughs> through high school, through college. And then Redemptor, I had nine months to write because I was on contract. So I tried to go at it like the most 
orthodox way. I was like, I'm going to have an outline. I'm going to know everything in advance. I'm not going to write a single chapter that will be irrelevant because I'm all going to have it so planned. Like you can see where this is going. I basically had a breakdown like weeks before my deadline and decided to like introduce this whole plot line in which like the oppressed overthrow like the economic system. <laughs> it's like, which became the heart of the story. This is literally like weeks before it's due. It was a disaster and I'm happy with how it turned out. But all that to say, I have no idea which of those is better or worse. The one that takes 12 years or the one where you all of your carefully laid plans just scatter to the wind because you were too careful and you didn't let yourself play enough. And so you don't find the heart of the story until weeks before it's due. <laughs> so I don't know. I think maybe by the time I'm on novel three or four, I'll have a better answer as to whether I'm a plotter or a pantser. Right now, it's, <laughs> whatever happens is what I am. <laughs> Juliana Baggett said that every book, like you have to learn how to write all over again. And I've written about like five or six and I find that so true. I have no idea going in. I have to let the book guide me. Yeah. Every draft I write, I have to teach myself how to write again. Jordan, right. it's funny you mentioned this. I had that exact same experience like yesterday, maybe the day before, where I was like talking to my editor for my novel and I was like, okay, I just had this idea while I was like sitting around and baking some brownies, which is like, what if I turn this into a road trip novel? And it was just kind of like silence on the other end of the planet. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But I have some like ideas related to that. So we're going to, yeah. Um, <laughs> I love like the silence of terror <laughs> of an otherwise really supportive <laughs> editor or agent. I have heard that silence. It only lasts a few seconds, but it's amazing. <laughs> um, uh, so, okay. So we never learn how to like write until we're actually writing. We never know what we're doing until we're already doing it. How do you figure you're done with at least one draft? And then how do you get into the next one? Is a draft ever done? No. Because <laughs> it just turned in. <laughs> That's my first. The, 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 the like, saying yeah. is that they're they're not finished; they're abandoned, which seems very true. Uh, I know, for my part, I have sometimes said I think I've done all I can do with this story, and then sent it out a couple times, and then you know reviewed it and been like, oh. I actually have a lot more work to do on this, <laughs> but I couldn't see it at that time. Uh, so so I, I don't feel like I have a great answer as to, as a writer, I don't feel like I have a great answer as to when something is finished. As an editor, I often have an answer to, you know, as a, to, as a writer, I think I, you're done. Yeah. As a writer, I always ask is... I ask like the characters, is their story told all the way? That kind of helps me. It gets to a draft I can send to beta readers. I'm not saying it's a draft I send to my agent, but like have their has their story been told all the way? And has this thing the kernel of an idea I set out to do is that evident? And that's kind of where it is. And then like you said, I can't look at it anymore. That's another <laughs> another it's done uh, method. So I have weird oh yeah, I have a weird thing. Um, where I write, I, I keep doing drafts until something in my head clicks. And I can't explain what that looks like, but there's a point where I'm, you know, turning around and stuff that I go through a revision and suddenly something hits me where it's like, this is it. This is what the story is about. <laughs> and once I hit that click, I know that at that point, I found the story. All I need to do now is just tie up loose ends and then either send it out to beta readers or send it out. And that's actually when I know that it's ready to actually go out. And it may take a while um, for that click to happen, but when it does, it's like, it's magic. <laughs> so. And it, I use each time I actually start a new story, I actually worry because it's like I'm writing all these drafts. It's like, ah, I'm not going to get it. It's just going to go away. But then if you just keep at it, suddenly something hits. And yeah, so it comes. It just takes a while. I wish I just, that it was more of a like 
objective literary standard where it's like, I know this is done because it's hit this point and this point and this point. I have learned over the past few years, it's entirely psychological. Like now that I have a new, like new works in progress, the Ray Bear books, like while I was in them, while I was writing the sequel, while I was polishing up the first one, there were just, there was an endless list of stuff that I wanted to do. It's like, I could develop this area. I could stay in this district of this city for a while and just figure out how their economic system works and how that implies, like how that affects the people that live there. Um, but, and so it was really hard actually releasing any of these drafts. But the moment I fell in love with another world and another story, those books were fine all of a sudden. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure. All of those, those like, you know, it's it's not, I didn't really leave any loose ends that I'm that upset about, you know? Um, and I think, I think that's really what it is for the most part. It sounds kind of callous, but, and maybe this isn't for all writers, but for me, it's definitely like, the moment there's another like shiny new project to fall in love with. It's not that I fall out of love with this one. It's that I all of a sudden I'm content with it being what it is. Um, so I think that's it for me, honestly. I'm, I'm with um, LaShawn. I have those like epiphanies. This book is entirely about this, but they change. So I'll, I'll be like, this book is totally about injustice you know and then I'll write to that and then I'll be like this book is totally about love and then I'll write to that and like the answer is good enough for the time to get me through a rewrite it's to make it more cohesive but it doesn't always stick around until the end I'm gonna throw a small wrench into this topic and then I'll then I'll stop the uh when my uh debut uh collection of horror stories unseeming came out as as in the run up to it being published, uh, in 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 the run up to it being published, I had gotten uh, Thomas Ligotti, the horror writer, to to read it to consider it for a blurb, and uh, going through that experience with him was really wild because you know most people they just kind of send you the blurb and that's it, but he was critiquing each story as he read it, and. Uh, and making some terrific suggestions. And and so I asked him, well, you know, these stories are already published. Some of them published more than once, you know, is what what are your thoughts on like doing revisions to them? And, and he basically said, well, every time you have a story, you know, reprinted or put in a collection or whatever, you should always look at that as an opportunity to improve it. And I was like, OK, well. <laughs> I'm going to take that to heart, and so you know, so there, there's so you know, maybe maybe I become a proponent of the nothing's ever really finished school of thought. Okay, um, thanks, Mike. Let's let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so some of us are also editors, some of us are also teachers, some of us just work with other writers in critique groups or workshops. Um, so how do you structure critiques, uh, especially like with developmental issues, to be constructive and energizing uh, for the writers that you're working with? Um, and how do you navigate this process that can be really, really fraught and emotional? I always preface any critique I give, you know, unless, and, unless it is specifically for something that I am looking at buying with a caveat that I'm just one person offering one opinion, you know, you have no obligation, you know, to, to take this as instructions. Uh, so, so, you know, that's a way that, that's a way that I kind of try to soften the blow. Uh, and then, you know, I'll, if I, if I feel, if I feel it's necessary, I'll talk about, okay, these are some things that I like, but honestly, I won't spend too much time on those because what I want to do is tell the person, you know, this is how I think you can improve it. You know, these are issues that you you need to address. And so I, I just, I try to preface, I, I, I try to preface that with, a, with, a, you know, with, with that sort of, don't take this to heart and soul. Just, you know, I'm just one dude. I, I try to, the writer, um, I try to see the book and what the writer is after 
and um, I'm very much a proponent of talking about what does work because I find it's very hard for writers sometimes to only go with what doesn't. And so I try to recognize that throughout my notes. And my global notes are much gentler than my line notes. My line notes, I get inside the text and I'll start talking about why things don't work and why they do work. But there's sort of a, I recognize what you're doing here. Let's make it the best thing that it can be. Um, one thing that is a time saver if you are developmental editing is reading the book all the way through because sometimes the writer is learning to write at the beginning or they're learning who their characters are and they figure it out so well by like chapter 15 that you can say chapter 15 is a best-selling novel. The bad news is you've got to make the rest of the book that good, but you at least know they have the tools to sort of um, really bring it up and you have something to focus on. Um, so I've only worked as an editor in a non-fiction capacity, um, but as a person within a writing community, I, I, yeah, I'm a beta reader for other close friends who are writers. And I found that one strategy that really helps is for me to read for positives and then read for negatives. Because if I try and do both at the same time, it ends up being like, it, one ends up feeling really false, even if it's not. It's like, if I'm reading like, oh, I see what the problem is here. Like, this is this is why this isn't working. Then I'm like, nope, but you need a sandwich. You need to come up with something good to say. Then you like, like have to like, that feels really fake instead of just like read it. And this time in your head, no, you're noting what you like. Mm -hmm. And I and I do that and it feels wonderful. And then I go back and I'm just like, and then, you know, you remember the things. And sometimes the things you would have been nitpicky about before don't actually seem that important the second time around because you have like a bigger picture of what they're doing. So that's one small strategy I do as just someone as a beta reader within a writing community. Yeah, for me, when I do readings for Giganotosaurus, I actually read the story several times. Um, and for me, I actually have to sit and think about it. And I actually do like, you know, write, I, I keep notes. It's like, what what threw me in about the story, what what captured my eye, and what's not working. Um, and sometimes it's as basic as there's just nothing capturing my interest. Um, but that's also but I also know that it can that can vary from you know day to day because I could be having a bad day and nothing's gonna catch my inter interest at that point. So waiting until the next day when I can read it with fresh eyes, it's like, oh, okay, I can see this and this. And, but if it's still not capturing me, it's just not gonna capture. So I'll, I'll have, you know, I basically note that. Um, and yeah, it, it's, yeah, I, I like your idea, uh, Jordan, of list, was it you, Jordan? Or I forget who it was, it's like listening to, it wasn't you, sorry. <laughs> Whoever said listing the good parts first and then, you know. That was, that was Jordan. But I yeah, think was, yeah, to yeah. read for the good and then read for the. Sorry, the it's been a long week. It is absolutely fine. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, um, I find that needing that balance of what, you know, what pulls me in, what does not. And uh, I usually send my critiques out as rewrite, you know, rewrite requests um, if a story is good enough to actually, you know, pull me in. Um, otherwise, yeah. <laughs> the best read I ever got as a writer was from a beta reader friend who honestly reacted like a reader all the way through. So when something charmed her, she wrote that down and she got really emotional in kind of a great way. And then at this one point, she's like, oh no, I've lost this girl. I can't do her anymore. You know, those kind of like raw reader reactions were super useful to me. And I use it a little bit when I read through for other people. This is, this is not like actually a serious piece of advice, but if you, someone sends you something in Google Docs, you can add like GIFs in the comments. <laughs> and I think that's something Everyone should do more because you can sum up how something makes you feel <laughs> so easily. And I love it when my friends do that. So <laughs> nothing else away from the panel. It's that you can leave gifts in the margins. Of <laughs> I am going to do that from now on. That's awesome. <laughs> Deeply same. 
I, I love that idea that of like kind of like live tweeting uh, yeah you're exactly. like as you're going through and i've done that with students and i've done that with friends that i'm beta reading for as well um one thing that i found really helpful to me that kind of just like shifted how i thought about critique was having conversations after i had read a story um with the writer and just being like what is really important to you about this story what is it that you know sort of like what LaShawn was talking about earlier what's the thing that's clicking for you like what's the most cool awesome like thing that you were so excited about while you were writing the story um and then kind of shifting my critique to center that um rather than thinking about like and i mean i'm not an acquiring editor for anything i'm just and i'm a teacher so it's like it's all a learning process for me i don't have to worry about making my students like fit and ready for publication just being better writers um but yeah like getting to the heart of what their story is in their own words and then like helping them come up with ways to just kind of like do that the whole time basically that's a good um, question ahead of time yeah and it's it yeah. really shifted like it shifted me away from like wanting to fix things to just being like actually what what could this be and what do you want this to be so i think mike and Lashawn, you both started talking a little bit about like as you know your roles at edit, as editors at um giganotosaurus and mythic delirium um so how often and this goes for anybody else like how often do you require stories that need deep edits um and what are the things that will still make you choose a story even if it really does need a lot of development i've i've actually done that quite frequently uh you know i've even um you know i i have i have latched on to stories that i have thought okay there's there's a germ of something really amazing here but n not it, it it doesn't fully flower in its in its current form and i've worked i've i've worked with the author and i've had stories like that end up picked for best of the year volumes and things like that and uh it's hard for me to quantify what makes that happen i mean it's it's there it, it's you know i i have even had uh i i have even had instances where i have rejected a story like this this happened a couple times back when i was editing the clockwork phoenix anthologies and and yet it would still stay stuck in my head and i would end up going back to that author and saying hey is this still available and they'd be like yes why and i'd be like let's can we talk about this story <laughs> and and uh and you know i would i would explain you know when, whenever that happened i'd end up explaining okay this is these are the things that i would like to see in it if you're interested in doing that and it's inevitably resulted in you know me publishing the story but uh yeah i mean there's a subjectivity to to purchasing poems and stories and and, and novels. Uh, I can't always exp I can't always quantify why something digs a hook in that I can't pull out, but it definitely happens. You know, even with stuff that sometimes needs work. Uh, I can I'll, I can cite I'll cite one specific example. Uh, I won't mention the author, but in in my most recent anthology that Mythic Delirium put out, A Sinister Quartet, there was a, a novella that I read. And for maybe the first, it's it's kind of similar to what I believe uh I believe Kate might have described something like this, where where for the first two thirds or so, I, I was kind of thinking, you know, this really this 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 really is not together. And then something happened. And like the final third was amazing. <laughs> and so I I went to this author and said, look, you know, you, from, from this point on, I I absolutely love it. We just we need to make the rest of it match. Uh and 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 it ended up working out very well. But uh, I don't know how helpful that is to anyone, but I I know that's how the process works for me. Um yeah, I so with me. I um, usually there are stories that I will go through, and there is something about it. And and 
like you said, Mike, it's subjective. I don't know what it is, but there is something that grabs me and it'll be like, oh, the story is wandering all over the place. Hello, what's this? You know, <laughs> and it, it, it yes. you know, it will pull me in and it's like, okay, this part over here is kind of sloppy and this is sloppy, but there's this idea like right here that's like really fascinating. And I wish they would expand on that and just get rid of the other, you know, stuff. And it usually takes me a while to actually formulate what exactly I want to, you know, I want to see. Um, and once I, you know, it takes me a while to figure it out. And once I do, that's when I actually sit down and, you know, get back to the writers like, okay, I, I like this, but this is, and I usually don't do, do this in the draft itself. I usually do it when I'm, you know, replying back to the writer. Um, it's like, here's where this is, here's where I got lost and here's where I couldn't understand, but you have this thing that is amazing and I want to see that wound more in your previous stories. So please do a rewrite and then send it back to me. I can't guarantee that I will take it, but you know, at the very least, I hope it improves the story. And usually, and for the ones that I, I don't do it as often, um, cause usually my time's a lot more, you know, a lot more limited. Uh, but the stories that really grab me in that way, nine times out of 10, they actually do get back to me with rewrites and I read it and I go like, oh, this is great. I will publish it. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> That's a great feeling. It really is. Yeah. Okay, so let's come back around to talking talking about ourselves as writers. Um, so most of us, I'm sure, have gotten like really big picture feedback that's also sort of kind of vague on details, and it's things like you know, oh, this this character arc needs to be strengthened, and you're like, well, what does that mean? Where is it weak? Like, I don't understand what strong looks like, um, or like the second act feels saggier, it feels slow, you need bigger stakes, you need more tension. So how do you translate? Actually, no, this goes for editors as well. So editors and writers, how do you translate that feeling into feedback? And as writers, how do you translate that feedback into actionable steps? I had a big one with my first um, published novel, which was I got a critique that was like, this is way too long. Why is this so long? But I realized, holy crap, he had no idea that there's a battle for this person's soul during their funeral. He's like, this funeral is going on forever. And I was like, ah. So I try to tell writers to think about critique as um, they're not seeing what it is you were really after. So if there's a vague note uh, like that, you know, try to look at what you were after and make sure you're trying to get it across. I mean, and it's hard when it's a huge novel one, like that character arc is, you know, but if it's something specific, like a scene, I could instantly see what, what he was not seeing. And um, I went back and made sure to hit that point over the head a little better. And the scene as a result got a lot more tense and better. I think it's, it's weird. It feels almost organic when I receive a piece of feedback that I know is what the story needs. It's almost like I hear it as how to fix it. Like with Redemptor, my agent who's wonderful, she like does a line edit of everything I write before it even makes it to the editor. Um, she's um, She basically said, I feel like what's keeping this story from getting off the ground is like the same problem that some people say with the Lord of the Rings movies where it has like multiple beginnings, <laughs> you know? Um, and the moment she said that, I knew where the story needed to begin and where the other stuff could go in because it made sense. It made so much sense. Um, and then the things that make me go, huh, I don't, that doesn't quite seem like in the spirit of what I was going for. Um, I don't know. It's almost like if I can't think of a way to do it, it either means like a whole bunch of stuff has to go or that that's not the right piece of feedback because the ones that really resonate, I almost know immediately how to approach it. Um, that sounds so mysterious. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, like, right. anyway, anyway. like, put it into words. That's what happens. Um, I think for me, in terms of giving feedback within my writing communities, um, I if it's a really, if it was something that would require a really big edit, 
um, I generally just tell them how I feel. Like at this point in this story, I didn't understand this thing. You know, mm -hmm. I don't, I try not to like get with, if it's like a really big thing, I just don't think it's helpful to get super specific with how to fix it. If it's a medium or a small size thing though, then I'm off all full of suggestions <laughs> and they're usually too specific and I have to consciously draw myself back. Um, I think because since my experience with editing, like as a job wasn't fictional, it was very much like clarity. Like I, if someone, if someone says something, if a character says something, I'm like, oh, I know what happened with that voice. He needs to say it this way instead of this way, <laughs> instead of, and then I have to draw back and think, okay, so you establish this character as this kind of person. I don't think he would say this thing this way. And I know how to fix it, but I'm not gonna say anything because <laughs> this isn't my story. So um, yeah, I go vague with big things and my instinct is specific with small things. Okay. As, as, go ahead. Okay. I think uh, one thing think to keep in mind, Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is a problem. I, I thought you were looking up at me, but you were probably looking up at LaShawn. LaShawn, go ahead, please. <laughs> I, I think also to keep in mind is that when you do get feedback, one of the things you should ask yourself is, is it valid? Um, and that is something where, where you, you actually look at and say, will this, will the edit actually work for this story? Because if it's something where you don't agree with it, um, you can say no. It, <laughs> it is entirely possible because in the end, this is your story. And I can make suggestions for, on the editor's side of what would fi you know, make, fix this. But if, that part, you know, if that's something that's important to you, then what it means is that maybe i'm not the right audience for your story because again it's all subjective what works for me may not work for someone else what doesn't work for me will work for something for someone else so that's something to take into account when you're looking at you know when you're looking at the edits and you know and sometimes you know you can you know push back uh to against you know your editor is like and if you explain the reasons why then the editor can then work with you it's like okay i see where you're going let's work on making this a bit clearer and that's when the editorial magic comes through so that conversation is so important and also um get when you get those notes sort of listening to the story before even yourself or the editor like listen to the book and what it's telling you or the story what it's supposed to be because sometimes you haven't done it all the way. I, I I had two things to share, and after Lashawn just talked, I have three things. I'll try and make it all very quick. Okay. Uh, you know, earlier I kind of patted myself on the head about having helped some stories along, you know, all the way to like years bests. Uh, I should also say that I have had uh, I have had experiences where I've gone to a writer and said, "I want this." And they have said, uh uh, no way, but I'll do it this way. And they've ended up being absolutely right. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and done very well for themselves too. Uh, so, so, you know, I want to, uh, you know, clap at bringing that up. Um, I've been very lucky in that I've not been in a situation, well, maybe this is a version of luck where I have like a contractual obligation to somebody who was giving me extremely vague feedback. I, I have had vague feedback, uh, you know, with with uh, my, the examples that I can think of are a couple of short stories. And those were cases where uh, I basically said, I'm not, I need you to explain, you know, more clearly how you want me to do this thing you're asking for. Uh, and then, you know, when they didn't do that, I didn't end up you know, sending the story back to them. So, you know, that, that's, that, that, that I guess is another option available to a writer if you want to go there. Um, for me as an editor, uh, if I'm, you know, because this is almost always a situation where I'm deciding if the, I want to publish the story or not. Uh, my feeling is if, if I cannot put my finger on why, uh, something isn't working for me, then I'm, I'm just going to let the story go 
uh, and maybe it'll work better for a different editor. Mm -hmm. That was my two things. Thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes left. So we're going to take a couple of questions uh, from the audience and discord. Um, so for folks who are watching at home, um, if you have a question, please just put the word question somewhere in your question. Uh, I have to put like a little search term pulled up so I can actually see them. Otherwise, it just gets lost in the scroll. Um, so we've already kind of been talking about this, but um, have you ever submitted editing suggestions to a writer? The writer disagrees and tells you why, and you were convinced that the author had a good point. Um, and also just like as writers, like how do you deal with Feedback that just rings false in to you as the as the writer. Well, I can answer the second question because um, um, I got that for one of my uh, short stories. Um, I submitted to it and I got a long list. It basically I got re rewrite request back. Um, but it was just a long list of things, which some of it, some of it was really good feedback, but some of it was like changing a lot of the parts of the story to the point where I didn't recognize my own story anymore. And I actually had to sit and think about it and come to a decision on whether or not I would actually, and at first I, I said, um, I would, you know, do the re rewrite request and. A lot of it was okay. The pacing is, you know, the pacing is much too long. Cut it down. Um, you know, this this scene, you know, this person, you know, is not really needed and all that. But yeah, another one wanted me to add a villain, and I was like, that's not the point of the story. <laughs> In the story is between these two women, you know, who have a friendship. And so, um, and then it turns out that I saw that, you know, another magazine had just opened submissions. And I realized, you know what? I think that would be a better market. So I wrote the first market and it's like, thank you for the suggestions. I'm going to withdraw my piece. Um, and I actually did tighten it a lot more and I sent it off and it sold immediately. I, I get, yeah, I love being edited. I love getting uh, editor notes, but every once in a while you will get a, uh, an editor who just obviously didn't get the story in the notes that they're giving you. And I've withdrawn one or two stories for that very reason and they've gone on to publish elsewhere. I think it's just that there's a miscommunication there that and you don't you don't have to publish just because it's been accepted. I was yeah. reminded of the time that uh, I don't remember who this woman was. I think she was just giving me feedback on a play that I was writing and she got really pissed off because I abandoned her suggestion that one character take a fork and stab a random guy in it. And I was just like, <laughs> this is absolutely not what the story is about, but thanks. she got so mad about it. Um, okay, so other questions from the audience. I have, I have, I have an answer to that one, actually. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I do think, you know, this is really specific but it's really depressing when someone who you know is otherwise a talented editor is letting their personal biases about you get in the way. Um, this happened to me at a creative writing program at a famous university in another country that I got to do a one semester program at. And I was doing it through my university, which was very small. And it was also a religious institution um, that's its own can of worms, but basically this prestigious university already kind of looked down their nose at students from this school because they assumed like they sit, like it's a Quaker university and yeah, Quakers are like really diverse and all that stuff. I'm not a Quaker. Anyway, all that to say, I think they just assumed in their heads that we were like literally like from like the Quaker Oats box, <laughs> like we were like Canaanites or something. And um, okay. yeah, and so they just assumed that they needed to treat us with like glass, like with tongues. And I was writing this character, it was a teenager, cause I was still trying to write young adult fiction, um, who sounded like 
a California San Fernando Valley teenager. And they have all these ticks they use. They say like, like this, like this. And I'm not going to do that freaking, the freaking this, the freaking that. And so I wrote it like that because they have all these silly little quirks. And I just remember this professor saying like, he looked me in the eye and said, I want you to have the courage to actually write this character in the way they would say, you know, like you, you seem to have a problem with, with, you know, the F word. And I'm just like, no, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> that's what Los Angeles teenagers sound like. And he literally said like, are you sure this is the way they would sound? Or is this the way you want this story to be read when your parents read it? <laughs> it was just the most dripping, condescending. Like, I was wow. like, <laughs> I didn't even know where to begin. I was like, you have never been to California for one thing. <laughs> and just like, yeah. And from there on out, I just kind of phoned it in with that tutor. I was just like, <laughs> you have so you have so many issues. <laughs> Bias yourself. Um, but yeah, that's that can be really frustrating. And when you have things like that, it's really hard to see like what is valid criticism? Because I had to be there all semester, right? So like, I, I was determined to get something <laughs> out of this. And so it's just, it's, I think it's, it's basically trying to like salvage what you have. Luckily, a lot, I think a lot of us now are in situations where we, we aren't like locked into something. So like you guys said, if the editor isn't connecting, you can just leave. But when you can't, <laughs> or whatever. Right. Um, it's just taking a step back and realizing like, any objective set of eyes, even if it was the set of eyes of, you know, a three-headed monster is going to see something <laughs> that you don't. And so you have to, like, at least, at least filter it instead of just, like, blocking all of it out. Um, so. <laughs> that is excellent, excellent advice. We are about three minutes away from the end of this panel. I'm so sorry to everybody who has been putting in questions. Um, panelists, if you want to hang out in the Discord after this Yeah, end, yeah we can hang awesome. out after, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so don't worry. We will, we will continue talking there. Um, but in the last two minutes, real quick, um, uh, let's do really quick outros if you have any parting advice, parting thoughts, and also where can people find you and find your projects if you're going to be doing anything else here at Flex Foundry. Um, Jordan, would you actually mind starting? Um, I'm not going to be doing anything else at Flights Foundry. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I should check the calendar to make sure I didn't sign up for anything I forgot. But um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram. I'm technically on Twitter, but I'm never logged in because Twitter is bad for everyone's mental health. <laughs> and um, yeah, my books are available in ebook, physical, and audiobook. Um, the Ray Bearer audiobook was a finalist for the Audi Award. It's really good. I encourage people to get that from their libraries or indie bookstore. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Kate, would you go next? Um, yeah, I actually want to leave you with a quote from my favorite mentor, uh, Robert Barish, who said, if you show up and listen and work hard enough, your book or story will make itself apparent to you. Um, you can um, find out more about me, including a recent novella that came out on katemoriyama.com. And there's also info there for uh, developmental editing and classes. Thank you. LaShawn? Ah, uh, yes, I actually will be doing some more panels tomorrow. Well, I, I have another panel tomorrow. Um, uh, basically, the writing process as a whole. I also have a reading and a coffee coach. My very first <laughs> with coffee coach. So you can find me on Twitter at T Bone Jenkins. Uh, I actually do a lot of my fiction ranting there. Um, and uh, I'm also on Facebook, but just follow me on Twitter. It's easier. So, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Well, uh, I am on another panel on a similar topic in four hours. Uh, and and I have, I have a reading uh, on late Saturday or early Sunday, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, and I'm also a dealer at Flights of Foundry. Uh, you know, I, I'm offer so you know I'm I'm one of the people with the red designations in the in in the sidebar on Discord, and and I will be around in some form, just about all weekend. Uh, anything 
if you can remember the words mythic delirium and any search, any search anywhere that you do using those words will lead to me. <laughs> and and uh, you, know, I'm 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 vending for for mythic delirium books here. You know, some that I've published myself, some that, you know, some that I've published from others, and I'm offering. I'm offering like discount deals like I haven't offered since the last time I did it a Kickstarter. So I hope that will make uh, people curious enough to take a look at what they are. Okay, um, we are actually officially out of time. Thank you all so much. Thank you thank for you, everybody Nito. tuned in and I guess that's it. Signing off. Bye. Bye.